Good evening. It's Friday, July 26. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu works to mend ties with former President Donald Trump today and offers no positive news of progress towards a ceasefire deal for Gaza. Netanyahu's nearing the end of a contentious U.S. visit that puts on display the growing American divisions over support for the Israel-Hamas war. Former President Trump, the Republican nominee to retake the White House, welcomes Netanyahu to his Florida estate for their first face-to-face meeting in nearly four years. Former President Barack Obama and former First Lady Michelle Obama endorsed Kamala Harris in her White House bid, giving the vice president the expected but still crucial backing of the nation's two most popular Democrats. The endorsement announced today in a video showing Harris accepting a joint phone call from the former first couple. Hot air balloons bring an Olympic ring of fire into a rainy sky, and singer Deline Dion belts from the Eiffel Tower as Paris kicks off its first Summer Olympics in a century. Meanwhile, arsonists attack France's high-speed rail network, paralyzing trains traveling to Paris for some 800,000 people across Europe, including athletes heading to the opening ceremony of the Games. The saboteurs targeting remote locations far from the capital with apparently coordinated attacks uh, sought to cut off rail routes into the city from all directions. Scores of wildfires across the United States and Canada scorching swaths of land in California, Oregon, Idaho, Alaska, Alberta, and beyond, forcing evacuations and road closures, as well as destroying and threatening structures. In California, authorities say the park fire near Chico tripled in size in one day and is now the state's largest at over 160,000 acres, thousands evacuated and an unspecified number of structures have been destroyed. Here in the Bay Area, evacuation orders issued this afternoon for the Point Fire, a vegetation fire burning near Concord and Bay Point. And Bay Area scientists and climate activists urged the Port of Oakland's board to reject the Oakland airport's proposed expansion, citing environmental and public health concerns. From Pacifica Radio and the studios of KBFA in Berkeley, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu working today to mend his ties with Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump and offering his routine assurances about progress towards a ceasefire deal for Gaza as he neared the end of a contentious U.S. visit that put on display the growing American divisions over their support for the Israel-Hamas war. At Trump's Florida Mar-a-Lago estate, where the two men met face-to-face for the first time in nearly four years, Netanyahu told journalists that he wanted to see U.S.-mediated talks succeed for a ceasefire and the release of hostages. I hope so, Netanyahu said when reporters asked if his U.S. trip had made any progress. While Netanyahu at home is increasingly accused of resisting a deal to end the nine-month-old war to stave off the potential collapse of his far-right government when it ends, he said today he was certainly eager to have one and was working on it. I think there's been some movement because of the military pressure that we exerted. Um, I I hope that there will be sufficient movement During his term as president, Donald Trump went well beyond his predecessors in fulfilling Netanyahu's top wishes from the United States. Yet relations soured after Netanyahu became one of the first world leaders to congratulate Joe Biden for his 2020 presidential victory over Trump. 
a formality among world leaders that Trump chose to take as an insult, but today dismissed. We've had a good relationship. I was very good to Israel, better than any president's ever been. The two men now have a strong interest in restoring their relationship, both for the political support their alliance brings and for the luster it gives each other with their right-wing supporters. A beaming Trump was waiting for Netanyahu on the stone steps outside his private club and residence in Palm Beach, Florida. He warmly clasped the hands of the Israeli leader. For both men, today's meeting was aimed at highlighting for their home audiences their depiction of themselves as strong leaders who have gotten big things done on the world stage and can do so again. Reporter Caroline Malone with more. Israel's prime minister has met with multiple U.S. leaders and officials this week, pushing for continued Washington support. The latest talks between Netanyahu and the Republican candidate for president, Donald Trump, were also a chance to mend relations. Four years ago, when Trump was last in the White House, the two worked on a deal to normalize relations between Israel, Bahrain and the UAE, and the U.S. embassy was moved to Jerusalem. But Netanyahu was also quick to congratulate President Biden after he won the 2020 election, angering Trump. U.S. officials and Trump have called for Netanyahu to finish the war with Hamas quickly and have cited how bad it is for him on a global stage. That's Caroline Malone reporting. Netanyahu's Florida trip followed a fiery address to a joint meeting of Congress on Wednesday that defended his government's conduct of the war and condemned American protesters outraged by the killing of more than 39,000 Palestinians in the conflict. Yesterday, Netanyahu had met in Washington with Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, both pressed the Israeli leader, to work quickly to wrap up a deal to bring about a ceasefire and the release of hostages held by Hamas. Trump's campaign said he pledged in today's meeting to make every effort to bring peace to the Middle East and to combat anti-Semitism on college campuses if American voters elect him to the presidency in November. Netanyahu handed Trump a framed photo that the Israeli leader said showed a child who has been held hostage by Hamas-led militants since the first hours of the war. We'll get it taken care of, Trump assured him. A letter signed by some 45 doctors and health care workers who have provided aid in Gaza urges President Joe Biden and First Lady Jill Biden to stop arming Israel and calls for a ceasefire in the Gaza Strip. It details the dire humanitarian situation there and accuses Israeli forces of targeting preteen Palestinian children, saying they all treated children with shots to the head and the chest while they were working in Gaza. It says nearly everyone in Gaza is sick, injured, or both, and the death toll is likely much higher than Gaza's health ministry's public data of some 39,100. Britain's new Prime Minister Keir Starmer's office says the United Kingdom will not interfere with the International Criminal Court's request for an arrest warrant for Israel Prime Minister Netanyahu on war crimes. The decision separates Starmer's Labour government from the previous Conservative government of Rishi Sunak, who had planned to challenge the arrest warrant. The ICC deadline for challenges was today. ICC prosecutor Karim Khan sought warrants for Netanyahu, and Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant and <clears throat> three members of Hamas in May over the October 7th attack on Israel and Israel's ensuing war in Gaza. The Labor Party last week also reinstated funding for UNRWA, the UN agency that provides aid to the Palestinians. The United Nations Security Council met today to discuss the Middle East and the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. The council also addressed legislation in the Israeli Knesset or parliament dealing with UNRWA, the UN-Palestine Refugee Agency. Chloe Behrens reports. Earlier this week, Israel's parliament approved three draft bills which would hinder the work of the UN Relief and Works Agency, or UNRWA, in East Jerusalem. 
The legislation would also declare the agency a terrorist organization, following allegations that UNRWA personnel were involved in the October 7th attacks on Israel. Antonia Marie DeMeo is the Deputy Commissioner General of UNRWA. She said the proposed legislation is unjust. Together, we must push back against calls to dismantle the agency. UNRWA is targeted because of its role in safeguarding the rights of Palestine refugees and because it embodies the international community's commitment to a just and lasting political solution. The UN Office of Internal Oversight Services, OIOS, and the UN Security General opened investigations into Israeli allegations that UNRWA works with the Hamas militant group. DeMeo said although the OIOS investigation is ongoing, the Security General's independent review found no evidence to support the allegations. Muhannad Hadi is the UN resident and humanitarian coordinator dealing with the Palestinian territories. He said that UNRWA is having a difficult time delivering aid in Gaza. We know what needs to be done to aid the people in Gaza, but there is a gulf between what should be done and what humanitarians can do. The commitment or willingness of the aid workers is not an issue. It's the inability to achieve the mandate, and that is beyond our control. Almost 10 months into this crisis, a safe, enabling environment for the provision of humanitarian assistance still does not exist in Gaza. Hadi called for an immediate ceasefire to allow for the delivery of aid to Palestinians in Gaza and an unconditional release of all hostages. Riyad H. Mansour is the permanent observer of Palestine to the United Nations. He said the accusations against UNRWA are really meant to hurt Palestinians. Humanitarians in Palestine are trying to deliver on their noble mission in impossible circumstances and at the peril of their life. Our support should match their courage. UNRWA remains under attack. The real target of Israel from this attack are the millions of Palestinians who rely on UNRWA to stay alive and to secure their most basic needs. Mansour said in the coming weeks, Palestine will act in the United Nations to ensure the recent non-binding International Court of Justice opinion stating that Israel violated international law by illegally occupying Palestinian territory is fully upheld. Gilad Erdan is Israel's UN representative. He criticized the Security Council for never condemning the Hamas attack on Israel and the group's taking of hostages. He called on the body to immediately demand the return of the hostages. We cannot simply stand by as our men, women, and children remain at the mercy of these mutilators. Where is the meeting demanding the return of our hostages? Without their immediate and unconditional release, there is no hope for peace and security. Deputy Commissioner General of UNRWA, Antonia Marie DeMeo, said the Israeli parliament could vote on the UNRWA legislation as early as next week. For KPFA News, I'm Chloe Behrens. A anti-Gaza war demonstration will be held tomorrow in San Francisco at 1.30 at the San Francisco Federal Building. That's 97 7th Street in San Francisco. The demonstration to rally people who oppose Israel's war on the Palestinians and on the Gaza Strip and to also call for enforcement of the International Criminal Court's attempt to arrest Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for war crimes. Ukrainian presidential advisor Mikhailo Podolyak is arguing against striking any peace deal with Russia over the war in Ukraine at least any time soon. Signing an agreement with Russia to stop the ongoing war of aggression against Ukraine would be tantamount to signing a deal with the devil. The top advisor to Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said in an interview with the Associated Press, his comments come as pressure mounts on Kiev to seek an end to more than two years of fighting. Jennifer King reports. 
Якщо ви хочете підписати угоду з дияволом, Signing an agreement with Russia to stop the war with Ukraine would amount to signing a deal with the devil. That's the position of Mikhail Podolyak, a top advisor to Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Іншому масштабі, з іншими діями. In an Associated Press interview in Kyiv, Podolyak said a deal would only buy time for Vladimir Putin to strengthen his position. He says he wants political elites to realize that a deal where Russia does not lose or bear responsibility for mass crime is like signing a ticket for the continuation of the war on a wider scale. Абсолютно двопартійна підтримка України. Asked about US politics, the Ukrainian says he does not expect changes in relation to Ukraine, but wishes certain decisions would be sped up. Пані Харіс мені також подобається. Podolyak says Kamala Harris reacts hard enough to today's challenges and that Donald Trump is seen as a nonconformist who should visit Ukraine and talk to people who have already experienced more than 880 days of war. I'm Jennifer King. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KFC at Fresno, online at kpfa.org. Paris kicked off its first Summer Olympics in over 100 years with a spectacular parade of boats carrying athletes from the competing nations along the River Seine and a ceremony at the Olympic Stadium. But acts of sabotage on the city's high-speed rail network prevented many spectators from getting to the opening ceremonies and perhaps many athletes from getting to their scheduled competitions as well. Charles de Ledesma reports. France's renowned high-speed rail network has been hit with widespread acts of vandalism, including arson attacks, paralyzing travel to Paris from across the rest of France and Europe. The nation's sports minister, Amélie Udia castera hits out at the perpetrators of the attacks on the eve of the Olympic opening ceremony, saying it's appalling. I condemn them, I mean, extremely strongly. It's just unacceptable. It's probably a large-scale uh, sabotage with uh, some malicious acts probably uh, coordinating. Uh, we're still in the process of uh, analyzing all the impacts. The minister hasn't yet identified who's behind the vandalism. I'm Charles de Ledesma. French officials condemned the attacks as criminal actions. They said there was no sign yet of a direct link to the Olympic Games. Prosecutors in Paris opened a national investigation saying the crimes could carry sentences of 10 to 20 years. In Germany, officials there also opened an investigation. Trent Murray reports. Germany state rail firm Deutsche Bahn has warned of disruptions to its long-distance rail network in the wake of widespread acts of sabotage on France's high-speed train lines. In a statement, Deutsche Bahn said, quote, due to damage caused by vandalism, our long-distance services between Germany and France are facing serious delays and cancellations. The statement follows similar warnings from Eurostar, which connects France to the United Kingdom. International train passengers are being told to check their service status online before travelling to the station. Trent Murray, Berlin. And authorities in Belgium conducted terrorism raids on the eve of the Olympic ceremonies. Several people were detained. Alex Kadia reports from Brussels. Seven individuals were detained during 14 raids across Belgium overnight. They will now be questioned by Belgian law enforcement, suspected of planning terrorist activities. The country's federal prosecutor said the suspects' exact motives were still being established and made no official link to the Olympics. But French Interior Minister Gérard Darmanin thanked Belgian law enforcement for leading a judicial operation to protect us, hinting at a potential link to the opening ceremony. Dozens of Belgian police officers, sniffer dogs and anti-drone teams have also been deployed to Paris to assist French authorities with the massive security operation. Alex Cadier, Brussels. Among the teams competing for the Olympic medals in Paris is the Refugee Olympic team. For the third time, 36 refugees displaced from their homelands are representing some 100 million refugees worldwide as they compete in the Games. Carrying backpacks and small children, hundreds of people sleeping on the streets of Paris climbed aboard buses surrounded by armed police yesterday. The latest, if not the last, group of migrants and homeless people to be driven out of the city ahead of the opening ceremony of the Olympics. The group of largely African migrants headed for the fringes of the city 
and buses paid for by the French government and into temporary lodging until at least the end of the Games. Ed Donahue with more. While crowds are coming to Paris for the Olympics, migrants and homeless people are being cleared out. Most of the migrants are from Africa. Some have small children. Some have been sleeping in the streets. They boarded buses surrounded by armed police. Nathan Lequeu, an organizer for the activist group Utopia 56, says these families have been the victims of social cleansing and of the French government's fascist and racist policy. Natasha Gabetti is from Burkina Faso. She says instead of thinking about those who are coming here, the French government thinks about those who are passing through. Government official Christopher Dupera says the intent is to find homes for migrants. We don't really understand the criticize because uh, we, we are very, very much uh, uh, determined to offer places to these people and to take care of them. They are heading to housing in the fringes of Paris. I'm Ed Donahue. Former President Barack Obama and former First Lady Michelle Obama endorsed Vice President Kamala Harris's presidential bid in a video released today. The video showing Harris accepting a joint telephone call from the former first couple comes as Harris builds momentum as their party's likely nominee after President Joe Biden's decision to end his re-election bid and endorse his second-in-command against Republican nominee and former president Donald Trump. It also highlights the friendship and potentially historic link between the nation's first black president and the first woman, first black woman, and first person of Asian descent to serve as vice president, who is now vying to break those barriers at the presidential rank. Sagar Magani reports. Former President Barack Obama is endorsing Kamala Harris's White House bid. Kamala! Hey there. A campaign video highlights the former president and first lady calling the vice president. Michelle and I couldn't be prouder to endorse you and to do everything we can to get you through this election and and into the Oval Office. Oh my goodness. A person familiar with their talk says Obama and Harris have been in regular touch since President Biden said he'd end his campaign. They've been close for 20 years and she's often used him as a sounding board. Thank you both. It means so much. And and we're going to have some fun with this too, aren't we? Sagar Magani, Washington. The sweeping right-wing plan to shape a possible second Donald Trump presidency called Project 2025 includes the standard conservative ideas such as slashing government regulations, but also firing thousands of civil servants, dismantling altogether the Department of Education and giving power to the states. Roz Brown has the story. David Nevins leads the Bridge Alliance, a network of organizations working to promote healthy self-governance. He's also co-publisher of The Fulcrum, where he's enlisted experts to share their thoughts on each of Project 2025's decisions. The cross-partisan approach that we believe in is, in some cases, the federal government can do certain things more effectively, in some cases, not as effectively. And that's the discussion we need to have as a nation. Alarming to New Mexico conservationists, Project 2025 proposes slashing federal money for research and investment in renewable energy and replacing carbon reduction goals with efforts to increase energy production and energy security. Nevins believes many on the far right want to turn back the clock and erase societal changes that have occurred in the last 20 to 30 years. He says people can be afraid of change, especially when things are moving fast, but believes Project 2025 represents a lack of open-mindedness rather than seeking common ground to take democracy to its next level. The reality of America is that we are a diverse country in terms of racial, ethnic, sexual preferences, religion. That is the reality. And if we're going to live into the pluralistic dream of our founding fathers and mothers, We have to learn to make that work. While Trump has denied knowing much about Project 2025, nearly two-thirds of the authors behind the plan served in his former administration. This is Roz Brown, New Mexico News Connection. group has filed a lawsuit to prevent thousands from losing their right to vote in the state. Shantia Hudson reports. 
Campaign Legal Center says Alabama's House Bill 100 could potentially disenfranchise many voters just before the 2024 general election. This bill aims to expand the list of crimes that result in the loss of voting rights by adding more than 120 felonies to the existing list. Backers of the bill say it's necessary to protect poll workers. Blair Bowie, director of Restore Your Vote at Campaign Legal Center, highlights the impact this bill could have on Alabama voters. People who have been convicted of the crimes that have been recently added to the list, people who have the right to vote now, could actually cast their absentee ballots before the law goes into effect, taking away their voting rights. She says the problem is this raises concern on if people could face criminal prosecution for legal registration or voting if they attempt to cast their ballot. Currently, 40 existing crimes of moral turpitude disqualify someone from voting. This list would now include crimes like elder abuse, domestic violence, and stalking. Bowie says the group's main concern is that this doesn't deny voters the chance to make their voices heard in November. She says Campaign Legal Center's lawsuit argues HB 100 violates the Alabama Constitution that prohibits changes to election laws within six months of an election. This new additional definition of crimes of moral turpitude is set to go into effect at the beginning of October. Clearly within six months of an election, it clearly violates that constitutional provision. In Alabama, if you lose your right to vote, you have to go through the state's process of getting a certificate of eligibility to register to vote. Bowie advises anyone unsure of their voting status to visit restoreyourvote.org. For Alabama News Service, I'm Shantia Hudson. Butte County authorities have arrested a man and charged him with pushing a burning car into a ravine and starting the Park Fire, which has now burned more than 178,000 acres near Chico and continues to grow amid hot, dry conditions. It's just one of many fires burning across the western U.S. and Canada. That includes a new fire in the Bay Area near Concord, which has prompted evacuation orders. Max Springle reports. Fire officials say the park fire started Wednesday after a man pushed a burning car into a ravine in a park near Chico. That's according to witnesses. The ensuing blaze has scorched about 278 square miles in Butte and Tehama counties. The suspect remains in custody on arson charges. David Acuna of Cal Fire says human activity is responsible for the great majority of wildfires. We have noticed that 95% of all fires are caused by humans, by any number of causes. But fireworks is a significant cause. The Park Fire is the state's largest wildfire of the year. Some 1,600 firefighters are fighting it in dry, hot, windy conditions. Air tankers have been deployed to help fight the fire. Some 134 structures have been burned, and about 4,000 people have left their homes. Butte County Sheriff Corey Honey told reporters that it's very important that residents obey evacuation orders. People Chico need to pay attention. and uh, It wasn't uh, but a little over five years ago that we lost uh, Paradise, a populated area uh, during a a fire. I think that it's important for the city, uh, people in the city of Chico to recognize that this is close. Conditions can change. Honey said people living in built-up areas sometimes get a false sense of security when it comes to wildfires, believing that wildfires primarily are a threat to rural and less populated areas. My office in the city uh, the city of Chico, uh, emergency services and police department, uh, may have to ad- uh, order additional uh, or give additional warnings or make additional orders. Um, take those seriously. Be ready to go. Pay attention. Just because you're living in a populated area uh, doesn't necessarily mean you're out of harm's way. Officials say the park fire is moving dangerously close to the city of Paradise, which was largely destroyed in the 2018 campfire, which remains the state's most destructive and deadly fire ever. 85 people perished in that blaze. Meanwhile, a fast-moving brush fire broke out today near Concord and Bay Point, north of Highway 4. Evacuation orders have been given already for nearby residents. Fire officials say the Point fire has scorched about 150 acres and is 0% contained. For KPFA News, I'm Max Pringle. 
Massive wildfires burning across the unusually hot and dry western U.S. and Canada have led thousands to evacuate, with reports of at least one fire in California and another in Oregon creating their own weather. According to the National Interagency Fire Center, 78 large fires are currently burning in the west. That includes 31 blazes in Oregon, 12 in California, as dangerously hot temperatures continue to roast the West. Reporter Jackie Quinn. A tanker plane involved in fighting the wildfires in the Pacific Northwest has lost contact with fire officials near the Oregon town of Seneca. The U.S. Bureau of Land Management contracted the single pilot tanker plane to help battle the Falls Fire in Oregon, now over 200 square miles, burning at the edge of the Malheur National Forest. There's been no sign of the plane. Meanwhile, around Chico, California, where the park fire is burning, a suspect's being presented in court, accused of pushing a burning car into a gully, sparking the blaze. Sheriff Corey Honey. It is particularly mad that this particular fire was caused uh, by an individual. Dozens of Butte County residents have had to evacuate. The park fires consumed more than 130 structures and burned around 250 square miles since Wednesday. I'm Jackie Quinn. Almost two weeks after Hurricane Burl hit Texas, heat-related deaths during the ensuing prolonged power outages have pushed the number of storm-related fatalities to more than 30 in the state. The combination of searing summer heat and residents unable to power up air conditioning in the days after the Category 1 storm made landfall resulted in increasingly dangerous conditions for some in America's fourth largest city of Houston. Burl knocked out electricity to nearly 3 million homes and businesses at the height of the outages, which lasted for days or much longer, and hospitals reported a spike in heat-related illnesses. Lisa Dwyer reports. A rising number of heat-related deaths in Texas amongst residents who lost power during Hurricane Barrel has pushed the number of storm fatalities to at least 36. Officials have confirmed nine additional deaths. Some of those deaths have been attributed to power outages and heat-related causes. Barrel knocked out electricity to nearly three million people in Texas at the height of the outages. I'm Lisa Dwyer. Three men have been sentenced in federal court for their involvement in a plot to attack a power grid in the northwestern United States. Paul James Kresik and Liam Collins and Justin Wade Hermanson were sentenced yesterday for charges including conspiracy to destroy a power grid and illegally manufacturing firearms. Collins and Hermanson are ex-Marines stationed at one time at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Prosecutors say the men had white supremacist connections after Collins and Kresik were found posting on a known neo-Nazi internet forum. Authorities say the two recruited others, such as Hermanson, into their extremist group and researched a previous power grid attack heavily before their arrests. Recent Supreme Court rulings on air pollution are affecting the state of Virginia and other states across the country. Edwin Vieira reports. Climate advocates say the court overstepped its bounds in ruling the Environmental Protection Agency's good neighbor rule was improperly enacted and repealing the so-called Chevron deference. Without it, judges have to rule on ambiguous regulatory laws with no agency expertise. Craig Siegel with Evergreen Action says the court is diminishing the capacity of Virginia's federal climate partners like the EPA. By creating room to attack, for instance, carbon standards for power plants federally that Virginia might want to implement, or by making it harder for U.S. EPA to move us toward electric vehicles that would create jobs in Virginia and that would, you know, clean up the air, especially in northern Virginia, what's so congested. He adds this creates an opportunity for states to lead on climate action, but partisan opinions on climate change vary across the country. In Virginia, this means mixed efforts from utility companies and lawmakers. Dominion Energy is developing offshore wind, but it's also pressing on with a natural gas plant residents vehemently oppose. These rulings, coupled with decisions on presidential immunity and what constitutes bribery, have eroded the Supreme Court's perception of impartiality. Polls show most Americans across party lines feel the court puts political ideology first. 
Quentin Scott with Chesapeake Climate Action says this opens the floodgates to government corruption. We can't have this just blatant open corruption or it will diminish our effectiveness of government and enforcement of some very important rules related to pollution. He adds climate action will be a top ballot priority along with preserving democracy. Some of the top issues for the next presidency will be improving grid interconnection of clean energy projects and approving certain reforms for the Supreme Court. This is Edwin J. Vieira. Alameda County District Attorney Pamela Price has issued a 10-count indictment of Radius Recycling, formerly Schnitzer Steel, along with company managers for a two-day scrap metal fire last year at the company's West Oakland metal shedding facility, which released toxins into the air and the water. This is the first time that, a dis that this district attorney's office has actually held a corporation as well as corporate managers individually accountable under the felony statutes. And that is the message to those who are continuing to pollute, who have been uh, violating our rights in Alameda County with impunity, that there is a new day in Alameda County. And we intend to hold people accountable, that no one is above the law, and we will no longer have a double standard. The unsealed indictment alleges that Radius and two managers committed felony health and safety code violations, including recklessly emitting an air contaminant that caused great bodily injury or death, and knowing of reckless treatment, handling, disposal, or storage of hazardous waste in a manner causing an unreasonable risk of fire, explosion, serious injury, or death. The company faces up to $33 million in fines and its managers up to three years in prison. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno, online, KPFA.org. It's an hour-long newscast that airs each night at 6 o'clock. There's a half-hour edition at 6 o'clock on the weekends. All of our newscasts available online at KPFA.org. They're also available as subscription podcasts. I'm Mark Maracle. California Governor Gavin Newsom has issued an executive order directing state agencies to sweep homeless encampments and clear them from state land while giving local governments the authority to do the same. The order comes a month after a Supreme Court ruling, allowing cities to enforce bans on sleeping outside in public spaces, even if the homeless have nowhere else to go. Newsom released this video on social media. Today, we've invested now over $1 billion in encampment resolution plans. Not only clean up sites like this, but to address the underlying issue in the first place. One of the big issues, though, that has been an impediment uh, was the courts. In the past, the courts have denied the ability for local government, including the state, to clean up many of these encampments. Today, I announced an executive order to move the process forward. We're done. It's time to move with urgency at the local level to clean up these sites, to focus on public health, to focus on public safety. There are no longer any excuses. A billion dollars this state has invested to support communities to clean up these encampments. We have now no excuse. City and county officials are not legally bound to follow the executive order, although it says they're encouraged to adopt the same policies. Some local officials say they will continue to clear homeless encampments as they have been doing since the Supreme Court ruling, like the city of Oakland, which began removing a homeless encampment under a freeway overpass this week. The anti-police terror project, the APTP, posted video of that sweep saying the encampment was mostly of homeless disabled people and their families. In the video, police say over a loudspeaker, get your stuff and get out. The APTP said no services were offered, no shelter or housing provided for the evacuees. The ACLU of Northern California, among the groups condemning the governor's actions, saying the governor's plan to displace and dispossess unhoused people, even though the state does not have enough housing, is a cruel tactic 
that only masks the problem. Newsom's statement did also urge governments to provide services and support for the homeless and said he's invested $24 billion towards such efforts, including housing. Fresno County Supervisor Steve Randow announced he will soon introduce a ordinance to ban unpermitted camping on public and private property countywide. Randall's following the lead of major cities like San Francisco and Governor Gavin Newsom's executive order calling on officials to take down homeless encampments after that Supreme Court ruling that cities and counties can criminalize homeless encampments even if they have nowhere else to go. Brandau's district is mostly urban, but there are numerous county islands within the Fresno city limits. Vic Bedoyan reports from Fresno. Fresno County Supervisor Steve Brandau is seeking an ordinance he's calling the Unlawful Camping on Public and Private Property and Obstruction of the Public Right-of-Way. Brandau introduced the anti-camping ordinance in 2017 when he was on the Fresno City Council. He says until the recent Supreme Court ruling, the hands of local officials were tied in trying to deal with the most disturbing types of camping behaviors. By the time the Grants Pass case worked its way to the Supreme Court, you saw some crazy things happen, like you saw the city of San Francisco join in an amicus on behalf of no camping ordinances. You saw the city of Seattle join that in amicus on behalf of advocating for no camping ordinances. And then when the Supreme Court made their announcement, within 24 hours, Governor Newsom said, hey, thank you to the United States Supreme Court for um, making this ruling today. And then, oddly enough, this morning, many of you woke up and saw the news, and, and um, our governor made an announcement today that, uh, that the state needs to work with counties and cities to make sure that uh, we get cleanup of homeless encampments. Much of the enforcement burden will fall on the Fresno County Sheriff's Department. Sheriff John Zanoni supports the ordinance and the state directive. He says enforcement will be driven by complaints from residents or businesses. Deputies will not be rounding people up or looking for individual homeless people's camps otherwise. Look, our goal is not to go out and criminalize homelessness. I want to make that first and foremost. This ordinance and the executive order signed by the governor, these are tools that we have in our toolbox that we can use if we absolutely need to. Our goal is not to cite people and arrest people and incarcerate them because they are unhoused. Our goal is to get them from being some sort of public nuisance so people don't have to walk around their stuff or their encampment on the sidewalk, kids going to school and parents don't have to deal with that. Supervisor Brandau emphasized that the new ordinance would not mean the county is stepping back on their commitment to provide services to the homeless community. Nonetheless, homeless advocates in the room questioned the county's treatment of campers and their level of concern about their welfare. Bob McCloskey was one who pushed back on the county's narrative. The number one cause Amen. of homelessness by all, by all research okay. is poverty. And the solution is housing is not put people in jail. Come on, sir. Okay, let me, let me answer. So I don't disagree with a lot of your points, okay? I certainly agree that uh, poverty is, plays a massive role in homelessness. And, and I've never been one of those ones that say, Bob, and you and I have met, I'm not one of those promises to solve homelessness because I think as long as the economy struggles, people are going to struggle. Fresno County, according to officials, does not have enough housing for all who are unhoused. Supervisor Brando suggests that the city pass a similar law to cover their jurisdiction. That would increase the need for shelter. So will the money for housing be ramped up along with the increasing bans on camping? Supervisor Brando is hopeful. My first question when I heard the governor's announcement this morning was, did he attach money to it? So in the days to come, we'll be looking. If he's very serious about working with the counties and working with the cities, hopefully he'll attach some money so that we can address that. Now we have been, his strategy is to refurbish hotels and bring bed space into the situation. So he's been on that path and I believe there's another round of that coming up. The governor's office says it's invested some $24 billion into housing projects like Project Home Key, the effort to rehab old motels for the homeless. 
An even bigger program was recently passed by California voters. It's the Behavioral Health Services Act and bond measure. Fresno County is now pursuing several million dollars to build infrastructure in cities and rural areas throughout the region. Sheriff John Zanoni says he hopes those programs, along with a change in behavior, can make progress in reducing homelessness and its impacts. Hopefully, with this new ordinance, with the executive order by the governor, people will realize that now there is a consequence to this. And if you don't comply and get yourself into some treatment, get into some housing or get some help, that you just cannot be there on the public sidewalk in the public parking lot uh, camping. Representatives from the local Chamber of Commerce and the Fresno Hispanic Foundation were there to lend support to the proposed ordinance. The ordinance would prohibit unpermitted camping day or night on public property. On private property, it would require consent of the owner and sanitation measures. It also prohibits blocking sidewalks or access to a business and transportation structures like overpasses or bridges. Violations are a misdemeanor with fines up to $1,000 or six months in jail. The ordinance will be considered by the Fresno County Supervisors at their next meeting on August 6th. Vic Bedoyan reporting for KPFA News and KFCF Radio. A judge this week rejected Texas's attempts to compel a deposition from one of the largest migrant shelters on the U.S.-Mexico border, dealing a new legal setback to a widening Republican-led investigation into migrant aid groups. The ruling by State District Judge J.R. Flores does not stop the state's investigation into Catholic charities of the Rio Grande Valley, which provides temporary housing for as many as 2,000 women and children when border crossings are at their highest. <clears throat> the border nonprofit is among several targeted by Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton over claims that aid groups are helping migrants enter the country illegally. Catholic Charities and other organizations have denied the accusation, saying the state has produced no evidence. The one-paragraph order by Judge Flores shields leaders of Catholic Charities from a deposition, and it is the second time in recent weeks that a Texas court has pushed back on the state's investigation into migrant aid groups. Earlier this month, a separate judge in El Paso rejected the state's efforts to close a shelter in a scathing order that accused the state of harassment. A group of Bay Area scientists and climate activists urged the Port of Oakland's board to reject a proposal to expand the Oakland airport, citing environmental and public health concerns. KPFA reporter Abby Tasker was at last night's board meeting and filed this report. The proposed expansion of the San Francisco Bay Oakland International Airport includes a new 830,000 square foot terminal with 16 gates, renovation of existing terminals, and 1,000 new parking spaces. Paul English, an epidemiologist with the group Scientist Rebellion, says the proposal would drastically increase pollution and health problems in the underserved East Oakland communities nearby. He says it's both a climate and a financial issue, since taxpayers will likely have to foot more hospital bills if the plan goes through. How many additional uh, asthma emergency room visits and hospitalizations will occur in the surrounding areas uh, due to the expansion, due to the emissions from the expansion? How many extra cancer cases will occur in adjacent areas? The group of scientists say that the port's draft EIR, Environmental Impact Report, released a year ago, does not include a local impact health assessment, and they're urging one. A health assessment could require mitigations. Their concerns are among more than 1,200 public comments on the EIR, voicing concern about the proposed expansion, according to Colleen Liang, the Director of Environmental Programs and Planning for the Port of Oakland, which owns the airport. She says they will address the comments before submitting the final report. The comments um, received were similar to tonight's um, public comments, air quality, greenhouse gas emissions, um, traffic, um, and um, climate change. So we are addressing those um, currently and our responses will be reflected in the final um, impact report. The American Lung Association State of Air 2024 reports more than 192,000 lung complications like COPD or asthma in Alameda County. That's about 10% or one in every 10 residents. 
and East Oakland near the airport in the 880 Interstate Corridor was identified in a 2016 report by Alameda County Public Health Department to have elevated levels of air pollution, with residents experiencing some of the highest asthma hospitalization rates compared to the rest of the region. Trucking, freight lines, and airlines all emitting pollution contributing to that. Jeffrey Beeman, a retired materials scientist with Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, warned during public comment the proposed airport expansion will compound existing health disparities in the surrounding community. Everything we do to make airplane travel more convenient or cheaper or more attractive, like the Oak expansion is aiming to do, will kill more people and nature alike. This isn't drama, folks. It's science, and it's here right now. Members of the Stop Oak Expansion Coalition and of Scientist Rebellion say that airlines are failing to meet climate goals but still claim to be green. In addition to carbon dioxide, a main cause of global warming, airplanes also emit nitrous oxide and fine particulate matter that contributes to strokes and premature death. The group say there are no current technological solutions to greening air traffic at its current demand, but they say alternative and more climate responsible travel options exist. Again, scientist Paul English. There's other alternatives. The full EIR for the California high-speed rail was recently approved for the entire length of the line. Um, there's other options for more environmentally responsible travel for California. For example, many of the trips that are taken at the Oakland airport could be done by train. Once the port releases the final environmental impact report, they will vote on the proposed expansion. The port says it anticipates a final EIR this summer with potential construction beginning in 2025. For KPFA News, I am Abby Tasquier. A group of DEA Drug Enforcement Administration agents joked about rape in a WhatsApp chat months before one of them was charged with rape in Spain. This is according to new documents obtained by the Associated Press, which says the documents unveil a culture of corruption among DEA agents who parlayed the agency's shadowy money laundering operations into a global pursuit of crime. Donna Warder has the story. The DEA documents describe federal narcotics agents involved in a worldwide pursuit of binge drinking, illicit sex, and money laundering. Many of the documents focus on ongoing investigations following the 2020 arrest of former agent Jose Irizarry, who's serving 12 years in a federal prison for money laundering for the very Colombian drug cartels he was sworn to police. Other agents Irizarry claims were also involved were either quietly disciplined or fired. In a WhatsApp chat group, agents talked about their world debauchery tour and forcible rape. In a 2018 case, an agent was arrested for allegedly raping a 23-year-old woman in a hotel in Madrid but U.S. officials never spoke to the woman, and the agent was flown home hours after his arrest. A Spanish judge eventually dismissed the case, and the agent returned to duty. The DEA has refused to discuss its handling of the case. Donna Water, Washington. Two new lawsuits allege decades of sexual abuse at a Chicago juvenile detention center. The complaints, one against Cook County and one against the state of Illinois, were filed in state court on behalf of 193 women and men who were housed in the Juvenile Temporary Detention Center in Chicago between the years of 1995 and 2022. The complaints alleged Dale officials implemented systematic and unconstitutional strip searches of juvenile inmates at the juvenile jail and that those searches provided the opportunity for the sexual abuse of minors. Lisa Dwyer reports. A pair of lawsuits filed this week in the Illinois Court of Claims are the latest to detail harrowing instances of abuse at the hands of employees at juvenile detention facilities. In this lawsuit, some were as young as nine years old. Survivors include 35-year-old Tamarcus Washington, who says it's still difficult to talk about what happened at the Cook County Juvenile Temporary Detention Center about a decade ago. I did what I had to do to survive in there. But the act that those staff members forced me to do still give me nightmares. There were two similar lawsuits filed recently in the Illinois Court of Claims. In total, the accounts of nearly 400 survivors have been documented in the court, with more lawsuits expected to be filed in the coming months. I'm Lisa Dwyer. 
The Nebraska Supreme Court has upheld a new law restricting access to both medical care for transgender youth and abortion. The ruling came today in a lawsuit brought by the American Civil Liberties Union representing Planned Parenthood of the Heartland. The ACLU argued that the hybrid law passed last year violates a state constitutional requirement for legislative bills to stick to a single subject. The state argued there was no violation because both issues fall under health care. Lawmakers added the 12-week abortion ban to an existing bill dealing with gender-related care only after a proposed six-week abortion ban failed to defeat a filibuster. U.S. officials say a powerful Mexican drug cartel leader who has eluded authorities for decades was duped into flying into the United States where he was arrested alongside a son of the notorious Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. Norman Hall reports. The Justice Department says Ismael El Mayo Zambada, a historic leader of Mexico's Sinaloa cartel, and Joaquin Guzman Lopez, the son of another infamous cartel leader, were arrested in El Paso on Thursday. A leader of the cartel for decades alongside Joaquin El Chapo Guzman Zambada was known for running the cartel's smuggling operations, but keeping a lower profile. The Drug Enforcement Administration had offered a reward of up to $15 million for information leading to his capture. The Justice Department says the Sinaloa cartel is one of the most violent and powerful drug trafficking organizations in the world. I'm Norman Hall. A new report from the United Nations says nearly 40 million people were living with the HIV virus that causes AIDS last year. Over 9 million weren't getting any treatment, and the result was that every minute someone died of AIDS-related causes. More from reporter Donna Warder. A new UN report says that every minute someone in the world dies of AIDS-related causes. UNAIDS, the UN agency leading the effort to end the global AIDS pandemic, says nearly 40 million people were living with HIV last year, but more than 9 million people weren't getting any treatment. The report says that while advances are being made to end the AIDS pandemic, progress has slowed, funding is shrinking, and new infections are rising in the Middle East, North Africa, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and Latin America. The report says in 2023, about 630,000 people died from AIDS-related illnesses. That's more than double the target for 2025 of fewer than 250,000 deaths. I'm Donna Water. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken's traveling to Asia and Indo-Pacific areas for visits to Laos, Vietnam, Japan, the Philippines, Singapore, and Mongolia this week and next. Blinken, who's already modified his travel schedule twice since the trip was announced just hours after President Biden made his decision not to seek re-election, arrives in Laos tomorrow for the annual ASEAN Regional Forum. The Security Conference gathers the foreign ministers of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, and regional powers like China, Australia, Japan, Russia, South Korea, and India. Cloudy skies are predicted around the San Francisco Bay Area tomorrow with highs in the mid-60s. It's cooling off in the Bay Area's interior Valleys under partly cloudy skies, highs tomorrow in the mid-70s in those inland valleys. Slightly cooler in the central San Joaquin Valley and the Fresno area tomorrow. Sunny skies are predicted with highs in the mid-90s. That is it for the news tonight for this Friday, July 26th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. For 75 years, KPFA has presented progressive voices who spoke truth to power. Odetta. Odetta, you were one of the first women I ever saw wearing an afro. I first 
saw it on a dancer by the name of Jenny Lagon in Los Angeles. And when she did programs of African lore, she would have her hair in natural. And I remember running into her at City College in Los Angeles. And uh, she was getting ready to do a program, and she had that natural. I said, hey, Jenny, and, but, and I was talking to her, but I couldn't keep my eyes away from her hair. 94.1 FM, 75 years of building community trust. Support us today at kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.